Hey there, fellow wackadoos! Hello again, and uh, welcome back to Dr. Doodle's Cubasic Asylum, where, as always, well, y'all know me, uh, I'm the Dr. Doodle, your guide and chief nut job in this madhouse. We're at episode 17 now. Yeah, 17. It's a uh, Q Basic Mishamash. As the name implies, we got a little of this, a lot of that, and uh, maybe something completely other. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, this time, whatever we'll be talking about, um, what are we talking about? Oh, yeah, a little bit about file compression. Kind of interesting. Uh, I did a, a little thing called a pinwheel, which uh, I don't think I invented it, but uh, it's new to me anyway, and I, I find it useful. A little, little uh, structure or trick that I that I do, call, I call it pinwheel. So, um, Let's get started and check it out. Oh, by the way, if this episode seems a bit more slapped together than usual, well, that's only because it is. It is. It is. As the name implies, mishamash, just jammed together. So let's do this. Get this thing going. Here we go. All right. Well, now we have our, our TNT base program. Of course, by Dr. Doodle, Copy Left 2023. And we're going to run this pig and see what happens and give you an idea what, what this is all about. And boom, here we go. Now you notice we got this line says loading and then like a progress bar with the spinny dealy right here. Represents if you're loading graphics, sound, maps, whatever. In this case, it's not really doing anything, but in a real program, it could be loading all that stuff while you wait. And boom, there now it says program loaded, executed. Oh, look at here. We got us a, it's like a fuse or uh, flames. And then here comes a TNT and... Boom! So that's about it. So, how does this work? Well, we initialize the program. Uh, we clear the screen, cut color 11. That's, that's the color to uh, that light aqua color that you see. And then we go to our main program loop where we locate 2, 1. That's two rows down and one column over. We print loading. You saw that up there. And then, of course, for A equals 10 to 80, that's the, when the bar, progress bar goes across like this. It's from 10 up to 80. Okay. B is 1 to 100, we locate 2 and A, it goes up spinner, for D equals 1 to 50, next D, and then B. What does all this mean? Well, let's just go to the spinner and it'll give you a better idea. Spinner, okay, here's the spinner subroutine here. It says, select case F, but if you notice, well, F, uh, it's a uh, character, F dollar sign, and if the case equals this uh, backslash here, then F is set to pipe. If the case equals the pipe, then F is set to forward slash. If the case equals forward slash, then F is set to the hyphen. And if case else, where it's the hyphen or whatever else, then uh, F is set to the backslash again. So basically all this does is it starts, it goes to select case. Every time you call the subroutine, it says, well, what is F right now? If it's this, it sets F to that, the next step. If it's that, it sets F to the next step. If it's that, it sets it to the next one, and anything else sets it back to the first. So basically, what happens when you call the spinner, it just goes through around, 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 sets itself. You don't need an external F, an external variable somewhere. The vert of variables internal here, it's all taken care of in this select case structure. That's the pinwheel that I was telling you about earlier. So we, we go with this, it, the, it takes a look at what the F currently is, and then sets it to the next, next character, the pipe, the forward slash, hyphen, backslash, whatever, then it prints F and returns. So, we go back up here, that's the pinwheel. It just, instead of having a external video, uh, external variable, it all takes care of it all itself. You don't have to worry about it, it's all self-contained. So, we go to, again, we print loading. A is uh, 10 to 80, for B, basically it just means it prints that spinner 100 times to give it a little spin because it's so fast. For D equals 1 to 50, next D, that's just a simple delay. After it's spun around 100 times, now it goes locate to print A, and there's the hyphen. This is after it's spun around, we print that hyphen. Now we go up, A is now 11, so it moves over a column, does the same thing over, prints another hyphen, goes back up to A, moves over to 12, and spins around 100 times, and that's as simple as that. That's all that is right there. That's just the progress bar on top. Once we've done that, we go down to here, where it says print, program loaded, executing. We sleep for a second, set the color to four. Now, this is all just simple prints. You've seen this print statements, locate, 10, 30, print. You can see this is the box for the TNT bomb, whatever you want to call it. Now we color 15 is uh, that kind of white color. We locate and print TNT 
right in the middle of the box. And then finally we locate 11, 1, and print. That's the fuse, which goes over here. Once that's done, we go down to here. We do x equals x plus 1. You'll see that in a moment. For i equals 1 to 50. We locate 11x, so wherever x is, starts out 1, and then 2, and 3, etc. Go sub blaze, and blaze, what that does is it's similar to the spinner. Uh, yeah, blaze, it's another pinwheel. Because if you notice, we start with select case CLR. If case CLR, if it happens to be 1, then it sets it to 2. If it happens to be 2, then it sets it to 3. If it happens to be 3, then it sets to 4. If it's 4, it sets to 5. If it's 5, it sets to 6. And anything else, then the CLR is set back to 1. So I'll just go through the cycle. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then it just selects the color 4 is a dark red. Color 12 is lighter red. Color 14 is yellow. And then white. Then back down to yellow. Back down to red. And eventually back to dark red. So it cycles from dark red, red, yellow, white, yellow, red, dark red. It's round and round and round. Point of this is that... Where do we go here? Locate, yeah. When it locates... X, this particular, the first time through, X is equal to 1. So it's the first spot over here, and it goes sub blaze to change the color. It goes sub spinner to spin it around, and then for D equals 1 to 100, next D, that's just a simple delay. Next I, back up here, we're now one, piece, one space over, and uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, not yet. It go, next I, 1 to 50. Yo, baby. Hmm. <laughs> Now we go to do, and we have x is set to 1, or x equals x plus 1, because it starts out 0, now that sets it to 1. For i equals 1 to 50, we're just looping through here 50 times. We locate 11x, that's the, the, the fuse here, right here. The x happens to be 1, so it's going to be print, well, it'll be on screen over here. But the first column, then we go to so blaze to change the color. Go some spinner, that spin, prints a little spinny thing. For uh, D equals 1 to 100, next D, that's just a quick delay, and then back to I. So what it's doing is it loops 50 times, and it prints the, the little spinner, the different characters, 50 times. Once it's done that, it now goes locate X, uh, 11 X and print the space. So instead of sp printing a hyphen, it's printing a space to clear the hyphens that are already there, if that makes any sense. Well, I'll run this, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah, here's... We talked about this early loading, and then there's a progress bar going across. And this spins like 50 times just so you can see it spin, because otherwise it's so fast you wouldn't even see it. Now we got loading, and it's printing and then moving over, moving over, moving over. After it's done the 50, boom! Pause here. So we have, we've uh, printed our, our our progress bar across the screen. Now we come down, we have printed the box there, the print TNT in the center, and there's our fuse, which in reality would be over here, first column like that. So we go to do, and we're looping here. What we're doing is X equals X plus one. So it's X starts out zero, but this sets it to one. So for I equals one to 50, and next I is here. What we're doing, we locate 11. So 11 down and X, which is one column over because we set it to one. We go sub blaze to set the color. Now we go with spinner, and for 50 times it's going to spin around. Once it's spun around 50 times, it goes down to here, locate 11x, and print this, the space. So at this point, the first time through this whole loop, the second loop, uh, it's the x is set to 1, so it prints an x, um, I'm sorry, it prints a space right where the spinny was. Next time it comes through, it does the whole thing over, but x is now 2, so the spinner is over here. Spin, 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 spin comes down and then it prints a space where that spinner was. Loops back up here, moves over to the third column, spin, 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 all the different colors. And the colors are meant to represent like uh, sparks or fire or what have you. And then it comes over each time. Essentially, before we were moving the spinny across and drawing a hyphen after it. Now we're erasing the hyphen that's already there or the, the spinny that's already there by putting the space there. So same idea, you can use it for any number of uh, tricks and what have you effects. But that's basically how this works. Now we go to, like I say, uh, we go sub blaze to change the color, go sub spinner to print the spinner, delay for a short bit, next up, and then it spins for 50 times, then it comes, 
locate 11x, which is now, well, first starts at 1, and then it prints that afterward, prints the space. If, okay, here we go. If x is equal to 30, then goes up, boom. Well, this means if it's 30, if it's come over 30 spaces, then it's hit the, the TNT, and boom. We loop, and that's it. Next. Here are our subroutines. We talked about spinner already. And again, this is our, our pinwheel section right here. It's just this select case, select case uh, structure, which instead of having an external variable, it just sets itself. It's all self-contained. Blaze is the same thing. It's, it's select CLR, and the, the, the actual test uh, value, I guess you call it, CLR is self-contained and it's set right inside itself. So you don't need external variable. And then boom is simple enough. You just clear the screen, do, go sub blaze, print boom, sound. Now this is interesting. Sound 38 times random, or plus random times 50.1. What is that? Well, this goes, it just loops through, loops while in key equals nothing. And the sound, that 38, that's like a low, I don't know, it wouldn't be an, an A even. It's something lower than the, the, the keyboard. Random is a random number times 50, so it will either give you from, what, 38 minus 50? No, no, sorry, 38 plus nothing to 38 plus 50, point 0.1. That's point 0.1 seconds, so that's just that low rumble that you hear. Loop while equal, in key equals nothing, and then once you press something, system ends the program, and you don't really need the return because it doesn't go after, anywhere after a system. But just for the syntax, it wants to return anytime you have a subroutine. So that's effectively how this works. We'll run it again and give you an idea what's happening. Again, we're spinning and it moves over each time, but then it leaves that hyphen there to represent the, the progress bar. Eventually gets, and again, it's really doing nothing in this program, but it, you could use it to show the user something is happening in the background. Then we print this. Now it's moving the, the spinner just like before, but with different colors. And instead of leaving a hyphen, it's erasing it. And boom, of course, well, that's obvious what's happening. So that's how that works. And that's the, the pinwheel that I'm talking about. Uh, hopefully that's clear as mud. Uh, but yeah, that's now we'll move on to data compression. And this is kind of cool. Some interesting things here. Hang on, here we go. Okay, now it's time to, to talk about the types of uh, data compression or file compression. And so we've opened up here, this is QBA 17.base archive demonstration uh, by Dr. Doodle, copy left 2023. Now this is, as the name implies, archive. It shows how archiving files works. And we'll just run this here, give you an idea what's happening. Oh, but first of all, we'll shell all right, if you'll notice, we, we're in the directory QBasic, uh, QBasic, QBA17, and the directory of the file, of text files, is we got the QBA17B and QBA17B2 text files. Those are the only two text files in here. Now, we exit out, boom, and we run our program, uh, run. And if you notice, this is reading archive file, archive file rush. It's getting Getty, Neil text. I'll take a look here. You can't see it's gone off the screen here, but the first one says reading archive file rush dot yyz, and it says getting file title alex dot text, extracting file alex dot text. Next, it comes down read, reading archive file rush dot yyz, getting file title Getty dot text, extracting file Getty dot text. Reading archive file rush yyz, getting file dot title or file title neil dot text, extracting file neil dot text, and finally reading archive file rush dot yyz, getting file title john dot text, and extracting file john dot john dot text. Down here at the bottom says four files extracted, operation complete. And now if you look at the directory of, of QBA17, we still have the QBA17B text, QBA17B2 text, but now look here. Alex text, Getty text, John text, Neil text. What's happening here? Where did all these, these text files come from? Well, if you notice rush.yyz, that is known as an archive file. In other words, the contents of these four files Alex, getting John and Neil were all compressed and stuffed into. Well, they weren't compressed; they were just stuffed into Rush.yyz. Why do we do that? Well, I'll give you an idea. Hang on one second. Okay, so we got Alex text, Getty text, John text, and Neil text. Let's take a look at the contents. We'll type uh, Alex dot text, and boom, there it is. It says Alex. Type Getty. 
getty.txt. And boom, in the file it says getty. So all the contents is just the name of the person. In this case, it could have been the content, the declaration of independence, but in this case, all it is is that the, the guy's name's type neil.txt. And again, neil, type john. text and John so if you notice up here Alex text is six bytes why six well four characters but there's also if to see the space there when you save a text file there's also a line feed and a carriage return so that's two bytes so Alex four bytes line feed five bytes and then carriage to return six bytes hence Alex is six bytes Getty is seven because five characters plus two is seven. John, again, four characters plus two is six. Same with Neil, six. So we add these all up, and what do we got here? Six, seven, six, and six. That's uh, what, 25 bytes, okay? So the contents, of the, the yeah, the contents of all these files, Alex getting the, John and Neil, adds up to 25 bytes. So let's uh, click screen here, and dir.yyz. Now notice rush.yyz is only 22 bytes. That's three bytes less than the, all the four file, files combined. Why is that? Well, you don't have the all the line speed feeds and carriage returns. So it, what it does, it takes all those four files, in this case it's just the names of the, of the people, stuffs them into one file called rush.yyz. This is known as archiving. And you can see it, it didn't save really only three bytes. However, again, if if each if Alex file happened to have the, the Declaration of Independence and maybe Getty had Magna Carta in it, well, that would be much smaller. It, instead of having the four separate files archiving, it would make it much smaller. Plus, which I want to show you something else. Exit here. Hang on a second. Yeah, baby. I need it, girl. All right. Now, if you notice, here are the, the text files, Alex text, Getty, John, and Neil. Well, we already talked about that was six bytes, that's seven bytes, that's six bytes, and that's six bytes. But let's look over here, what have we got? One kilobyte, one kilobyte, one kilobyte, one kilobyte. What's happening here? Well, the actual contents of the files, in this case, just Alex, Getty, John, Neil, those four names, the actual content is only six or seven bytes. But the size on disk is one kilobyte. It's because the minimum that DOS can, or well, DOS or, or Windows, a minimum that the operating system can allocate for each file is one kilobyte of space. That's the smallest amount of disk space that it can allocate for one, one specific file. This is why if you look at the Rush YYZ, the archive file, that's only one kilobyte because even with the, the contents of these four files squashed in here, there's still, what, almost a thousand kilobytes left over. You see, there, there's just slack, it's called. There's empty space in this file, just as there is in these. But because these are all compressed into here, instead of having one kilobyte, one kilobyte, one kilobyte, one kilobyte, you just have one file at one kilobyte. This is one way that we well, we don't compress the data, but we, we store it more. It compresses the file, I'll put it that way, but it saves space on disk because instead of having four files with one kilobyte each, we've got just one file, one kilobyte. Now, archive files, you'll hit, see them sometimes. They're zip files, .zip, that's the same idea. It's just taking a bunch of separate files, like all of these files would be crammed into a zip file. It's the same thing. It's taking the contents of every one of these files, whoosh, slamming it into one file to get rid of the slack that's in, well this is nowhere near one kilobyte in size. This is nowhere near one kilobyte in size. But the minimum it can, this one's bigger of course, but the minimum that it can allocate is one kilobyte. Here's, here's two kilobytes because it's a bigger text file. But again, there is slack in each of these files, space that's not used. So instead of just having that empty space on the hard drive, we take them all, slam them into one giant file called an archive and then later we the the program goes through and looks at the, the data in that file it's, oh there's the next file it saves it or expands it out there's the next file expands it out that's what QBA 17 was doing was looking in the rush.yyz finding the the content inside there and expanding it out now let's take a look how that happens 
All right, well, so we got QBA 17 base open again. And our first line here, we will initialize our program. We set the path to C code QBasic 1 QBA 17. So that's the directory that where the archive file, in this case, file name equals rush.yyz. That's our archive file. Open path plus file name. So in other words, it's opening this file in this path. Open path plus file name for input as one. So it's, it's opening this file, rush.yyz, using it for info, input. Then we clear the screen. Now we go to the main program. Number of files equals number of files plus one. This just is a counter to let us know how many files we've extracted. Go sub stats, go sub extractor, loop until end of file one. Once we've extracted all the files out of here, then we print uh, empty space, and then it says color 14 yellow, print number of files. That's how many files we extracted, in this case four. Four files extracted, operation complete. Print screen, we shell, change directory to the path, and shell directory.txt. This, this is what shows the directory of the text files. And the close screen, sleep, and system. So we'll run this quick. Oh, actually, before I do that, let's, let's take a look at stats. Stats subroutine, which we call right here, once for each file, extractor for once for each file. In stats, it just says color 14, print, reading archive file, the file name, that's rush.yyz. Now print getting file title, and that would be the, the first it's Alex, then Getty, then Neil. Input one, it's inputting from the archive file the title of the file print the title plus text. So the first title is Alex, so it prints Alex.txt. Now color nine, print extracting file, the title plus text. Sleep and return. Next time through, we're doing Getty, so it's, it says uh, reading archive file, rush.yyc. Color print getting file title. Input from one, next we've already input uh, Alex, now we're inputting Getty, gets the title, and then print Getty plus text. Color nine, print extracting file, Getty plus text. Sleep one and return. Same for Neil, same for John. That's all it does, it just prints the stats out on the screen. Now the extractor, it opens title, that's a, a new file, dot text, for output as number two. And if you notice, this is, uh, where is it? We open path file name, the, the archive file, open that as one. Now we're opening a new file, we call it number two, this way we don't have to close the first pile each time. We're opening title, or open title, that it takes the value that it got earlier, in each case, at first it was Alex, so this is open Alex.txt, then we create a new file called Alex.txt, for output as two. Now we print to file two, the title, and then print. That's just an empty space, close to and return. In other words, here it's opening a brand new file. It's using the title, which we got from the, the archive file up here. First time it's Alex plus text. So it opens a new file called title.txt for output as number two. We print to that file, we print the title, Alex. And then an empty space, close to. Next time through, it gets the, the name for Getty. So we'll open a new file, getty.txt. For output is two. We print file to the file two. We print the title Getty. Then the empty line, close to. Same for Neil, same for John. Again, the, the content here just happens to be their names. But if it had been, no, I don't know, uh, uh, script for um, a movie, whatever, uh, any text file basically, it would then print that information to the secondary file, which in this case is either alex.txt, getty.txt, neil.txt, john.txt, and then close the file and return. Once it has done all of this, we loop until end of file, there's no more files to extract, so we print screen, color number of files, four in this case, files were extracted, operation complete, print, and then we shell the, to the DOS and show the directory of text to show that those files do in fact exist. Uh, hopefully that's as clear as, as day, but I'm sure it's pretty muddy. In any case, this, that's the concept of 
you don't really need to understand the code so much as the concept. We're taking files that the minimum file is one kilobyte in size on the disk. There only, may only be five or six bytes of hell. There could be one byte of data in there. And all the rest is just slack. It's empty space. It's wasted. So instead, what we do, we have the archive file you saw earlier, rush.yyz. We take the contents of file alex.txt, getty.txt, neil.txt, john.txt, stuff them all into one file called rush.yyz. And all those bytes are, are crammed in there to take up more space in that one file. In other words, it just eliminates all the empty space from those four other files. There, hopefully that's, <laughs> hopefully you understood all that, but that is basically the first uh, technique for com compressing da uh, text data. As I mentioned earlier, every type of data has a different, uh, different technique for compressing it, but that's the first one. Let's take a look at the second technique. Hang on one second. All right, now, so we, we just looked at uh, one way to, well, not technically compressing, but to compress, uh, save file space and text uh, with archiving. In this case, we actually will compress data. Well, there's no actual code to do this because it, that would be very com complex, but I'll just give you an idea, a rundown of how it works and, and uh, the basic concept. So what do we have here? This is QEA17B.txt. And if, if, if you look at it, it's a fictitious form letter like you might get in the mail. Hey, buy our service, whatever. But here we see it says, Dear Mr. Bartholomew Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, We here at Totally Legit Industries would like to congratulate you, Mr. B Bartholomew Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, for your recent purchase of a award winning doohickey, blah, 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 blah. We all wish to inform you, Mr. Bartholomew Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Well, I think you get the, the idea here. Now, granted, no one's really got a name like that, but here we have a name or a, a piece of text, Bartholomew Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, that is repeated, what, one, two, or three, four, five, I think six or seven times on this one page that I can see probably farther, more farther down there. Uh, and also uh, the doohickey, is, or whatchamacallit, that whatchamacallit is there, is another whatchamacallit. And, you know, what if there was a way that we could represent all of this information without having to constantly duplicate this and duplicate that, and, uh, if we could just maybe abbreviate it somehow? Well, it turns out there is and we'll take a look at what that would look like. All right, now here, here is what a compressed version of that first file would look like using one technique. Of course, in reality, it's a much more sophisticated technique, more complex, but this is the basic concept. So here we have, dear Mr. Bartholomew, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, we hear blah, blah, blah. What you're seeing here is, it's called a dictionary, that is, it's basically the code goes through every word in the text, yeah, every word in the file, and if it has not seen it before, it gives it a number. So the ver very first word, dear, well, I haven't seen that yet, so it gives that a number, number one. And then mister, okay, I haven't seen that, that's number two. Bartholomew, supercalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalibrogenicalib
put them in the file, but instead of having to print this out however many times, the code then looks through here and says, oh, that's one, so dear, print that into the file, and two, mister, put that in the file, three, Bartholomew, blah, 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 put that in the file, and as it goes, it reconstructs word by word by word the original text of the original file. And as you can imagine, this would be much smaller than the original file. In fact, this is not even a full page. The other you saw was probably two or three pages. So that's the concept there, and that's another technique for uh, actually compressing data. In this case, it is actually compressed. It's represented in a way that's smaller than originally. However, knowing the, the, the algorithm, I guess the, the, the buzzword these days, knowing the algorithm, we know what to do if we see this number. Well, it just means that word. That number means that word. So it, it takes the, the numbers and reconstructs the original text using the dictionary up here. Boom, simple as that. As I believe I mentioned, different types of data, uh, text, uh, graphics, audio, video, um, or actual uh, binary code for a com or a computer program. Different types of text have different techniques that you use to compress them. But it all boils down to getting rid of redundancy. So again, supercalifragic, instead of printing it, printing it, printing it, you just compress it down to here, and instead of having to print it, you print it once up top, then every time you need it again, you just reference it by number. Same with, uh, oh, do, whatchamacallit, another one. Uh, there's a couple other good sized words that are compressed down to one or two characters. So that's the basic concept of, of uh, compression there. Let's take a look at some graphics compression. And again, this is something I don't have code for, but I think you'll understand what, what I'm going through here. Hold on. All right, gang, well, so far we've talked about uh, archiving files and that's uh, con jamming them together in one file, like a zip file or, or what have you, uh, so to save disk space. Uh, we've also talked about compressing uh, text, one technique anyway for compressing text and how to get the, the text back. Now it's time to talk about graphics, this is specifically bitmaps. Now how do we see this little smiley face here? This is the, our little smiley face. Now if you look, these squares are, well, each one of these squares represents one pixel. So there's a pixel, 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 et cetera, et cetera. We got our, what? There's white, there's yellow, blue, and red. So four different colors. Here's our pixel. We want to save this to disk. Now what do we need to do? Well, we need to know, uh, we need to know each pixel. What, where is it? What color is it? And uh, we need to save this information to disk. How do we do this? Well, let's take a look at this. Hang on one second. All right, now here we have the same same bitmap, of course, but now if you notice these numbers here, I don't know if you can read them or not, uh, but we've got, this is numbered now, each pixel that's row one, column one, and then color one. It doesn't match up with the color for QBasic, but it doesn't matter. This is just the first color we come across, so we call it one. All right, so this pixel, row one, column one, color one. This is row one, column two, color one again. Row one, column three, color one, row, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the idea. So how would we save this to disk? Well, we need to write down each of these pieces of information. We got one, comma, one, comma, one, then comma, one, comma, two, comma, one, comma, one, comma, three, comma, one. We got one, two, three pieces of information for each pixel. So 10 by 10, that's 100 pixels, times three pieces of information, that's 300 bytes of information. Just for this one little bitmap here, and that's 10 by 10 pixels. So if you can imagine a full screen, that would be oh, too much information. Right, so. Now, so how can we decrease that? Uh, well, I don't know about you, but I don't count one, 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 two, one, three, one, four. I just count one, two, three, four. I don't need to know the row and columns. I just need to know, know the number of the pixel. So can't we do the same thing with our bitmap? Well, turns out we can. Hang on one second. All right, so here again, uh, same bitmap. But now, if you notice, we just, instead of row one, column one, it's just one. Row one, column one, it's just pixel two, pixel three, pixel four, et cetera. One to, up to 10, 11, 12, 13, you get the idea. So now we're doing the same thing. We're just going pixel by pixel, but instead of recording row one, column one, color one, we're just doing pixel number one and color one, pixel number two and color two. Pixel number three, all the way down across. So now, again, the same 100 pixels, but now instead of three pieces, we got two pieces of information per pixel. Again, simple math, that's 200 bytes of information for this little image here. Now, so we went from 300 down to 200. Pretty good. That's not bad. But you know what we can do even better than that? Hang on one second. All right, again, we're, we're looking at the same bitmap, but if you notice, only one number in each pixel here. Why is that? 
Well, again, with data, data compression, the idea is to get rid of redundancy. And what are we doing when we count up? We're just count, adding one, adding one, adding one. So all we really need to do is just have the program uh, have a counter in there. So we know that we're looking at pixel one. The next time we add one, that's pixel two. We add one, that's pixel three. So we don't even need to record the pixel number. All we need is the color for that particular pixel. So we start up, we'll have the program will we'll draw out 10 pixels, that drop down 10 more, drop down 10 more. So we just, that, that'll be pixel color one, color one, color one, color, all the way across until it gets to the next row. One, one, one. Oh, here we got color two, color two, color two. So from three pieces of information down to two, now one piece of information for each pixel. Again, 100 pixels, 100 bytes. So we've gone from 300, 200, down to 100. Again, pretty good savings. I think just for re just for representing the uh, the data in a more efficient way. But we can do better still. Check this out. All right, now this time, if you notice, some of these pixels have no numbers at all in there. Why is that? Well, as before, we know that we're counting up, so we don't need the the, the pixel number, just the color. But really, don't even need the color at all because look at this. That's one. That's still color one. That's color one. So if there's, if it's the same thing, we can just ignore it. We can just have a counter on there and know that well, this is number whatever. Uh, now, what we can do is set. We'll look at our first pixel and see what color it is. In case it's in this case, it's one. Now we check the next pixel. It's no difference, so ignore it. Again, no difference, ignore it. No difference, ignore it. No difference. Go all the way through the first ten and then down to the second row here. Yeah, second row, again, ignore, ignore. Oh, wait a second, now we got something different. We have a different color. So, what we do is we check, what's the number of this pixel here? Uh, 10 plus four, that's number 14, and it's now color number two because it's the second color, color we've come across. So now, what we would do in our file, we would put one in the, 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 the bitnet map file. We'd just put one. Ignore, 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 ignore. Oh, now we've got a change here. So we put in a 14, and then a two, that's three pieces of information. With these again are same because the two is now the default color, so ignore, ignore, ignore. Up, oh, we're back to white again, so that's the 18, pixel number 18 and color one. So we got one, two, three, four, five pieces of information. And we go along, this This is a technique that I came up with which I call delta tracking because we're just looking for change. We don't care about anything about it. something changes now. Oh, wait a minute. We got to figure out what's changed where and to what color. It's really all we need to track. Now, I'm sure I have, didn't invent this. I'm sure someone else came up with this idea and scrapped it for a better one. But there's it's related to something called run length encoding, which is a, a more sophisticated technique. But again, if you look here, we just write one. That's our color or in uh, whatever language you happen to have, whatever color corresponds to that color. But this is our first color, so one. Ignore, 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 ignore. All the way through here to, oh, there's a change. So we... we Write down the number of the, the pixel and then the color. Same thing, number of the pixel, the color. So we just got one, two, three, four, five. You go through here. I, I like checked it out earlier. That's 61 bytes. So again, from 300 down to 200, 100 to just 61 bytes. Now this is actual data compression because what it is, we've actually encoded this information. It's it's not just more efficient. We've we've uh, changed the way that we write down the information. So this is, is 61 bytes of information for this one little image, and we save that to disk. Now, when we want to view it again, we can write the program that knows how to, to interpret this. So it says, oh, okay, well, there's my default color. It's one. I just keep writing pixel, 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 pixel until I see something different, and then it changes. We can get this, this image back exactly as it was, the full, well, 300 pieces of information just boiled down to 61. So that's that's the uh, data compression, uh, in, at least in graphics anyway. And of course, you've got uh, different techniques for audio, for video. Those are, I won't go into because they're much more much more complex. But I think you've got the idea here. The basic idea is just to get rid of redundancy, get rid of waste and slack, like with the uh, archives, all the empty space. Get rid of it. You don't need it. Don't don't use it. Well, all we really need to check here is. What color are we going for, and when is there change? We're check, tracking the changer, and that that same 
concept applies to different types of data. I'm sure there's more more complicated, uh, sophisticated things, things I haven't even heard of yet. Uh, but now we need to go, I guess we're doing our superiors, and then we can wrap this pig up and uh, let you go about your business. So hang on one second. Here we go. Superiors. Superiors. All right. Now, if you are interested in electronics as I am, you will not find a better source of information uh, than Mr. Ellen Wolke, who, who runs this uh, two, uh, W2AEW uh, web, uh, YouTube channel, uh, W2AEW, that's his, his call sign, he's very big in uh, amateur radio, but also anything electronics, I mean, oscilloscopes, how to use them, how to make measurements, uh, just an incredibly, his hundreds of videos all about this gentleman is an invaluable source of information for uh, use of scope to measure the length and what is it and uh, impedance of a cable, the coax cable. Here's a circuit tutorial, sawtooth, sawtooth generator, oscillator tutorial, basics of, of RF mixers. Uh, he's got all kinds of playlists for bipolar transistor videos, nano and VNA. That's a, a micro. A micro uh, oscilloscope but it just it, let's look at the videos here I mean the list is unbelievable it literally has hundreds and hundreds come on bring up videos it literally has hundreds of videos all things electronics uh, capacitors resistors inductance reactants uh, and then of course my computer wants to be pokey today but if again a bipolar transistor current mirror, mirror output that, that's cool if you're interested in electronics at all, you have to check out W2AEW. There is just so much great. It, this is a resource. I mean, it's an encyclopedia on one page, okay? You will not find a better source of information. That If you need to know about electronics, you will find your answer here. Uh, in fact, forgot to mention, Mr. Wolke is a former technician at Tektronics. Thank you, Mr. Alan Wolke. I tell you, you... We cannot thank you enough for your efforts. Just an incredible page. You have to check it out. Okay, back to the video. All right, gang. Well, that about ought to do it for this video. <laughs> I do believe we whipped this dead horse just long enough. So, uh, yeah, I hope that you hope that you've learned something. And uh, well, as always, thank you for watching. Uh, but yeah, if please, if you have questions, you don't understand some, be sure to put your questions in there and ask me. Hey, what the hell are you talking about? I don't know too much what I'm talking about, but uh, hopefully I can answer your questions if you have any. Thanks again for watching, and um, I guess I'll see you when I see you. Hasta la pizza, baby.